You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. So ultimately, going back to where is it freedom of speech, but then where does it go into inciting violence? One is protected under our Constitution. The other is absolutely not. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. Got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, my conversation with Laura Hoffner. She is Executive Vice President at Concentric, and we're going to be discussing the dangers of online threats to turning into real-world violence. The start of the year is a great time to take that next step in your education, career, and beyond. Rely on N2K certification prep to provide the tools to help boost knowledge, skills, and confidence to get you there. And now, for a limited time, all N2K certification practice tests are 40% off. Visit n2k.com slash certify and use promo code N2KVDAY. That's N2KVDAY to save 40% on your purchase. That's N2K.com slash certify with promo code N2KVDAY. Offer ends Monday, February 19th. Happy learning. All right, Joe, we got some uh, good stories to share this uh, week. I'm going to start things off for us. So, uh, you know, I have another show I do on our Cyberwire network called Research Saturday. Yes. And that is where I talk to. Uh, information security researchers about the research they're doing and and share the story of the research. Mm -hmm. So I recently uh, spoke to a gentleman named John Hammond from a company called Huntress, Mm -hmm. and they're in the threat hunting business. Um, And we were talking about some of their research on uh, malware called Baby Shark. Which is, uh, baby shark. Yes, it's called baby shark. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> you know what I have in my head, right? I everybody, do. yes, everybody I do. out there has that same thing in their head. Well, I didn't name it. So, <laughs> um, and it is the very interesting research from them, and goes into a lot of the technical stuff. So, if that's something you're interested in, that'll be coming up on Research Saturday in the next couple of weeks. But what drew my attention, and what I think is relevant to this show, is the actual uh, fish that the bad guys used and the 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 fish bait that I thought was particularly novel and in this case, very effective. Mm-hmm. So let me set the stage for you here. Okay. Uh, these bad people uh, who we suppose um, were from China okay. uh, were targeting think tanks. Right. So political organizations, uh, you know, people uh, uh, coming up with uh, policy opinions and things like that. This right? is something that China frequently does. They do indeed. So uh, what they did was they would reach out to people that they were targeting, and the email would say, VOA interview request, Hmm. China's role in North Korea diplomacy in times of rivalry. So VOA is Voice of America. Right. And they would say, I hope you've been well. This is so-and-so with VOA Korean service. I'm collecting experts' opinions looking at how China will factor into North Korean diplomacy. Will you be available for answering the below questions with about 200 words respectively? I hope you kindly consider. I'd be very grateful if you could send me your answers within five days. Thank you. And then there's a return address to Voice of America, so on and so forth. And four questions, right? Right. And they're all reasonable questions. So the person who gets this, uh, and I, I will add, no links, no attachments, right? It's, right. There's nothing... Nothing seemingly malicious Just here. looks like a regular old email. Right. Looks like a media request email. I get these frequently, actually. Yes. Yes. So the uh, victim replies and provides the answers to the questions, thinking that they're talking to someone at VOA. They want to be helpful. Right. Uh, the uh, threat actor responds and says, uh, many thanks for this. It's very good material. I did rearrange it a bit. Uh, to be secure, this is protected, and they have a link with a password. Mm-hmm. And they say, please let me know if it meets your mind. Thank you for your time and consideration again. So what they've done here, they've said, great job. Right. We had to make a few edits. Yep. Before we use this, will you please review the edits? Right. Uh, to make sure this is secure, I provided a password-protected link. Here's the password. So now 
If the person <laughs> goes through, it's a OneDrive link. They get a, they download a file. Right. The file was named VOA underscore Korea dot zip, right? Dot zip. Dot zip. Okay. They open the file. It's right. It's an Excel, or no, I'm sorry, it's a Word document. Word document. Right. Probably they, teeming with malicious macros. I'm, they open the Word document. Uh, they get uh, a thing that comes up that says, please enable macros. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Bob's your uncle. Right. Right. So they are got. Right. Now, what I think is particularly clever about this is the path that they lead the victim down. Right. By initially doing something innocuous, establishing trust doing it in a way that they can stroke their ego a little bit. Hey, you're an expert on this. Would you provide your opinions? People love to to provide their opinions, right? Right. right? And so they have an exchange back and forth, uh, establishing rapport. Then they provide a link with a password. Well, something with a password, that couldn't be bad. Passwords make things safe, right, right. Joe? Right. <laughs> and then uh, at this point, they download the file, a properly named file, nothing unusual here. This is a lot of effort. This sounds like it's an intelligence agency running this effort. Yes, and I believe it is. Yeah. I believe it is. Um, but it, it, that's what really caught my attention here was the the degree to which they go through the effort, but also the effectiveness of it. That right. I think this is a pretty good uh, pretense for This, this for is something, fish, right? Every now and then I come across one of these things that I say, this is something that would work on me, mm-hmm. right? And this is one of them because, like I said, I— from time to time, we'll get media requests that look very much like this. Yeah. Um, I will uh, generally, if somebody wants to wants me to write something, I I might I might take the time to do that, depending on who it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I think there was one thing I did for the Wall Street Journal where I, I actually wrote something. Mm-hmm. Right. And the, Voice of America is an outlet I know. Sure. Right. Maybe I would write something for them. Yeah. Uh, and then they would send me something back. I would like to think that when I got the email attachment that said, or when I got the uh, the file that said, please enable macros, that I would have been like, hmm. <laughs> well, and I have to say, in my interview with John Hammond from Huntress, he, he made the point, like, this is the part where the security researchers were sort of banging their head against the desk going, you know, all of these protections we put in place, right. all of these things we do, and the person still enabled macros, right. all the training, yeah. you know. So uh, while the training is good, the training is important, you still have to have defense in depth. You have to have beyond that things that can catch this sort of thing. Right. Um, and according to their research, once these folks got into this system, they were in there for about a year. Really? Yeah. Well, that, that's not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, you know, what we often talk about the economic situation of, of, of these malicious actors, but when you're talking about an intelligence agency, their incentive is different, mm. right? It's still an economic situation if you look at it, right? Yeah. Uh, depending on if you, if you like read like, uh, um, what Dubner and Levitt, uh, the free economics guys, they, they talk yeah. about the economics incentives are not always monetary. They're, they're, but they're still incentives. Yeah. And these guys are incentivized to lay low and just collect information. Right. That's their job. Right. So that's what they do. They're not trying to monetize this. They're just trying to collect the value is the information. So that's that's something that lets them remain as as unobtrusive as possible mm-hmm. while collecting all the information. That's why these uh, intelligence agencies, when they get in, they tend to stay there for a long time, like yeah. a year. Yeah. So, uh, again, interesting story. We'll have a, a link to the actual research uh, from the folks over at Huntress. And, again, there's a there's a Research Saturday episode that digs really deep into this. That'll be coming out probably in the next couple weeks. So if you're interested in that, stay tuned. That'll be coming up soon. Uh, that is my story this week. What do you have for us, Joe? Dave, I meant to tell you this last week, but uh, I am now a crypto millionaire. Really? That's right. Again? Yes. <laughs> okay. I go. bought a million Shiba Inu tokens. Oh. So now I have a million tokens. Okay. So uh, hmm. it only cost me 25 bucks to become a millionaire. <laughs> That's a very interesting um, I don't, I don't definition have a million. of millionaire. Yeah, I have if a million I say, uh, If I have a, 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 a million squares of toilet paper, am I a millionaire? Well, no, because that's not that's not a— uh, a, to- a token or or a coin that you can exchange for things. Uh, right? I, I can imagine circumstances where it could become valuable well, and worth yes, exchanging yes. for things. But I digress. <laughs> you go go back two years, I don't mean to hijack your conversation here. Go right. ahead, Joe. <laughs> also recently, I installed a non-custodial wallet on my phone uh, to hold some Dogecoin, right? Okay. Another equally valuable 
Uh-huh. <laughs> well, you're a high roller, Joe. I am. Dave. You're a high roller. <laughs> I am. <laughs> okay. And uh, you know, right now I have about twenty bucks in this wallet. It's, right. it's not a lot of money. Uh-huh. Uh, Do you have your phone handcuffed to your wrist <laughs> <laughs> so no one can grab it and run off? <laughs> yeah, I'm really worried about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I even went so far as to make some silly bet with my wife. I can't, I can't remember what it was, but I said, I'll bet you 10 Dogecoin that's not the case, right? Oh, and yeah. I lost the bet. Oh. So I had to go out and install a crypto wallet on my wife's phone and then send her 10 dogecoin <laughs> i see <laughs> that was about 14 cents Dave. okay it's a lot wow. of money yeah right a lot yeah. of cryptocurrency yeah uh but all of this got me thinking about scams that are connected to cryptography or cryptocurrency yeah not cryptography but because mm-hmm. if you think about cryptocurrency scams one one of the big benefits of cryptocurrency alleged or you know one of the benefits is touted is it's a decentralized means of transferring something of value. Yeah. Right. Or yeah. something. Right. That we can say has value. Right. It's intrinsically not valuable. We all agree. We right. all buy into the fantasy that it has value. Right. Which is, I mean, you know, fiat currency is pretty much the same thing. The same thing. thing. So, right. We all yeah. we all agree that it has some value. Although that has the good faith and backing of, you know, the federal the government. Federal government <laughs> and the FD, FDIC insurance and so on and so forth. Right. But go ahead. Uh but because these things are decentralized, they're, they're, I mean, they're trying to regulate it, but really the process will never be able to be regulated. Hmm. So if somebody says to you, Dave, give me 10 Dogecoin. Yeah. There's nothing you can ever do to get that, that, those coins back. Once it goes out of the block, blockchain, it's, it's permanent. Mm, right. Okay. So. Well, but, well, help me understand here, because right. haven't we had cases recently where law enforcement has clawed back they have. cryptocurrency funds? They so. have, but you know how they did that? They they, they broke have guns. That's how they did that. <laughs> well, they, they, <laughs> right. <laughs> they have guns. Right. That's right. They they put a gun to somebody's head and yeah. say, "Give me the keys." Very. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Actually, what they did in that in that case that was the uh, Colonial Pipeline case. Yeah. They found the affiliate. Uh, organization, not the actual ransomware company, but the affiliate who got the the bulk of the cryptocurrency. Okay. They found their keys online. Right. Their private keys. Okay. So once you have that, you have access to transfer the money out of the wallet. Okay. Right. Now that brings me to this uh, new Biz- Better Business Bureau report that came out last week about cryptocurrency scams. Mm. Right. They say that cryptocurrency scams accounted for the second highest losses. Uh, reported to the FTC with about seven hundred fifty million dollars. Wow! And there are a couple of uh, ones I wanted to talk about in here. One of the things they said in this article was that cryptocurrency market offers new opportunities for tried and true investment frauds, <laughs> such as Ponzi schemes and fraudulent initial coin offerings. Sure. Right? Yep. Anybody can say, "Hey, I'm going to start a new cryptocurrency," right? A- and you can actually do it. Or you can just say, give me the money and I'll give you the coins once we start the blockchain and then disappear, mm-hmm. right? So I wouldn't go in on an, on, a, on an initial coin offering. Okay. I, I, that, that is not how I would get involved with something. Right. Uh, personally. Uh, but one of the big things they do, these scammers do, is they do fake investments. And the Better Business Bureau talks about this in, uh, in, in this report or in this article Uh, You can link to the report from the article. But they say, after purchasing cryptocurrency, people are directed to websites where they create an account in order to monitor their investments. Now, these websites are look real for all intents and purposes, Uh right? But they're not. Anytime you want to make a withdrawal of your earnings, you're asked to pay more money to cover taxes or commissions or fees. Uh And ultimately, you can never get your money out. Hmm. They have one example of a customer who began learning about Bitcoin uh, in the summer of 2021. Mm-hmm. Probably locked in, you know. Said, what else are you going to do? What else are you going to do? Right. right. So she reached out on WhatsApp to an investing service she saw mentioned repeatedly in the comments of a YouTube video about Bitcoin. Mm. All right? Mm-hmm. So here's what's going on behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. There's these scammers. They're watching. They, they know where the Bitcoin videos are. Mm-hmm. So they get on there and they go into the comments and they go, hey, if you want to invest in Bitcoin, contact us on WhatsApp. Right. 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 Then you get on WhatsApp, which is an end-to-end encryption communication channel owned by Facebook. So don't use it. Um, <laughs> I should say meta, I guess now. It's meta. Yeah. Right. Uh, so 
these guys start scamming these people. She was instructed to buy $1,500 in Bitcoin via Cash App. Dave, did you know that you could buy Bitcoin on Cash App? I did not, no. Right over there, that's my phone. Okay. I have the Cash App app on that phone. Okay. Right? I didn't know I could buy Bitcoin with it. Oh, who knew? <laughs> but I looked it up as part, you know, as part of my exhaustive research for this episode. Sure right. enough, there it is. I can buy Bitcoin with it. Oh, okay. I don't know if that means I can, I didn't buy any Bitcoin with it because, you know, I don't have that kind of money, Dave. I, I <laughs> saved my money for Dogecoin and Shiba Inu. Coins. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> when, when, when some people zig, you zag. Right, that's right. Yes. <laughs> so she sends this, uh, sends the Bitcoins via Cash App. And 10 days later, she receives a screenshot displaying a balance that she had more than $7,300. Oh. So she's very happy. She says, let me have some of my earnings. And they say, oh, there's a 10% commission in broker's fee uh, of more than $800, right? So it's more than – it's a 10% commission plus a broker fee. Yeah. So – and and they're saying, okay, that's going to be 800 bucks to get your $7,300. $7, she pays both because she thinks I'm still up. Right. And then she receives an email to pay an additional sum of nearly twelve hundred dollars to withdraw her money, Ugh. and that's when she realizes this is a scam. Mm -hmm. So she gets off fairly cheap, right? She gets out of here for a little over two thousand dollars. Yeah, that's an expensive lesson. It is, it is. But we've seen losses that are are much higher. Sure. And immediately, what I'm happy to hear is that this woman said, "Yeah, this is a scam. I'm done." Mm -hmm. And and if if she'd have paid that twelve hundred bucks, there would have been another fee after that. They would have just kept charging her fees. Mm -hmm. That's how this works. Mm -hmm. So the tips, they have some tips in here. Uh, number one is guard your wallet. So you have two ways you can, you can keep your cryptocurrency, two main ways. You can keep, keep them in, a, in your personal wallet or you can keep them in, a, uh, in an exchange. Okay. The exchange manages the wallet for you, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you have your own wallet, like an app on your phone that's actually a crypto wallet that holds cryptocurrency, then you have on your phone – the keys, the private keys. Right. Right. Cri the cryptographic keys. The cryptographic keys. Okay. And one of the ways that you can transmit those keys is by something called a uh, a, a key phrase. Right? It's a it's a it's a passphrase. Okay. That's a bunch of different words that are not don't make any sense, but they're random. But really what these are are these words just map to different sections of your key. Uh -huh. So if you enter the words in the correct order, you are able to reconstruct your key. Okay. One of the big scams that these guys do is they try to get you to give them that. Oh. Because then they just need to install the wallet on their phone, enter the passphrase, and they have all your private keys, and bam, they will empty out your wallets in a matter of seconds. I see. Hmm. So don't do that. Yeah. Guard your wallets. Right. Don't pay for products with cryptocurrency. Uh, that's another big scam, apparently. Hmm. Huh. Uh, you know, I don't know how I feel about that one. Uh, you know, if, if there's a business out there that accepts products via via cryptocurrency or accepts payment via cryptocurrency and it's a reputable business, maybe. Yeah. If you're going to do a, an in-person trade, that's probably fine, mm -hmm. right? Beware of fake recovery companies, hmm. right? Somebody that tells you that you're, they're going to get your cryptocurrency back, and unless those people are like you said, Government officials with guns, they're probably not going to do that. <laughs> right, right. You know? Right. <laughs> it's just not really possible. Yeah. Uh, be wary of celebrity endorsements. We've seen this multiple times. There's always oh, yeah. that picture of Warren Buffett holding the big Bitcoin. Right. That's, that's actually not a celebrity endorsement. <laughs> right. Uh, only download apps from the Google Play Store or the App Store. Uh, and even here, you're probably not 100% safe. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these apps are going to be, you know, there, there's there's nothing that says in, in an app store that the app is, if the app is relatively new, they could give you a wallet address that looks like it's your wallet address, and it's just their wallet address, and the Bitcoin never shows up in your wallet on your phone. It just goes directly to them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And finally, the last one I'm going to talk about here is if you are looking at crypto investments, never believe promises of guaranteed returns. There is no such thing as a promise of guaranteed returns mm. on, in cryptocurrency. Even if you're talking about staking cryptocurrencies, which actually pay like dividends for holding the cryptocurrency yeah, because it uses a different way of generating the next block, um, there's no guarantee that that's going to be profitable for you, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and not, it's not like you know a bank account is FDIC insured. Like right. that does and that doesn't exist. That either. does not exist in <laughs> cryptocurrency. You right. are taking risks. Do right. not invest any cryptocurrency money. You are not prepared to absolutely lose. Mm-hmm. Like the twenty five bucks I, I paid to become a uh, a Shiba Inu millionaire, Dave. <laughs> I am prepared to absolutely just lose that twenty five bucks. In fact, uh. I view that that twenty five bucks as the cost of me being able to. Being able to tell people I'm a crypto millionaire. Think of your kids, Joe. Think I, of your kids. I paid 25 this bucks to make a joke. Reckless, reckless disregard <laughs> for the well, the future well-being of your family. $25. Goodness. Oh. Yes. Oh. My heart breaks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yeah, interesting stuff and good advice for sure. Uh, yeah. We will have a link to that. Again, that's from the BBB, the Better Business Bureau. Uh, they, they've always got good information on they this do. stuff. You know, it, it sort of surprises me because I, I think of the BBB as being kind of one of those old brands. Yeah. But they're staying current with this They really stuff. are. They're doing a good job with it. Yeah. yeah. I'll agree with that 100%. All right. Well, those are our stories this week. We will have links to them, of course, in the show notes. Joe, it is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from Andre, who writes, Dave and Joe saw this email titled, Please, I Urgently Need You to Help, and immediately thought of your amazing podcast. Well, thank you, Andre. (laughs) I've enjoyed the content for many years. Thanks for all you do for the security community. All right. So, Dave, why don't you go ahead and read this email? All right. It goes like this. I am John White of the U.S. Army Force and one of the commanding officers of the U.S. Central Command here in Syria. Please, I urgently need you to help me safeguard the amount of money I have here in my possession, which is worth the sum of 11500000 U.S. dollars. I came across this mega cash while on operation, as we were on a massive attack a campaign against the ISIS terrorist group. But minding how horrible and risky it is here in this military camp, I deemed it necessary to look out for a trusted fellow whom would assist me in safeguarding the cash until I get out of this horrible zone. It was on this effect that I started the search here online for an honest person whom I can trust to help me safeguard the cash, and I came across your mail address, and I want to know if you're willing to do this deal. I want you to know that I'm willing to offer you 40% of the total amount, which is $11.5 million, if you do help me safeguard this money and out of here. I will email you the details on how I plan on moving the cash out of this place as soon as I receive your response. Please get back to me ASAP. Thanks. John White. <laughs> Sounds like an American, doesn't it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sounds like someone whose first language is now English. My, now my throat is sore, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. I don't think we have a military presence in Syria, Dave. Uh, is that right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry to keep track of sometimes. It is. <laughs> it is. Uh, isn't our thing? The U.S. Army will never need anybody else's assistance in moving around $11.5 million. No. That is something they can handle. Yeah. You know, if they, they are from time to time, they do come into uh, large caches of things uh, mm-hmm. like weapons and possibly money. <laughs> they don't have any problem taking care of those things. They don't need your help. Nobody is going to give you 40%. I mean, that's just, I mean, first off, the whole thing's a scam, of course. Yeah. It's an advanced fee scam. Yep. Right. Yep. Hey, help me out. Uh, okay. Now I need $2,000 to set up this bank account. Mm-hmm. And then I'll transfer the money in there. And then you, okay, now they need another uh, $3,000 for this. It's, it's going to be the same kind of thing like it was in the story, uh, in my story today, where they just start adding follow-on fees. Right. Never engage with these people. Just delete the email. Or, or at better yet, send it to us so we can all have a good laugh. <laughs> there, you go, there you go. All right. Well, our thanks to Andre for sending that in. We would love to hear from you if you have something you'd like us to consider for our catch of the day or a story you'd like us to cover. You can send it to us. It's hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. Joe, I recently had the pleasure of speaking with Laura Hoffner. She is executive vice president at Concentric, and we're discussing the dangers of online threats turning into real-world violence. Here's my conversation with Laura Hoffner. This is an, an entire generation and career that we just haven't had to deal with until the recent history. And so we are slowly catching up as to how best to support this unique security paradigm that these influencers do have. 
And I think it ultimately comes down to an accessibility and a desensitization problem. So accessibility, meaning when in the past have we been able to watch someone in their bedroom, be able to interact with them on a regular basis and hear their stream of consciousness without feeling like we are their best friend, right? And so that line of that accessibility being the norm now, but that does not necessarily inherently mean that you have a relationship with them. And then the desensitization, as these poor influencers are streaming throughout their role online, the threats and the comments on who they are, what they look like, where they're living, and things that could be done to them is perceived as normal and okay. And so when that threshold for the noise is just so high, it's very hard to discern where it becomes a threat versus this freedom of speech line. So ultimately going back to where is it freedom of speech, but then where does it go into inciting violence? One is protected under our constitution. The other is absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, it, it strikes me that, that part of what is going on here is, is a real shift in how we think about celebrity. You know, I, I think for, for me, it being a little older and growing up and thinking of the celebrities that I admired or, you know, aspired to or maybe meet someday – Part of being a celebrity was that you had a team of people around you who were sort of managing these things. And it strikes me that these days, uh, you know, someone, uh, a YouTuber or a TikToker, uh, you know, can set up in their room and it's really just them. Right. The differences are, one, the size of that entourage, right? Right now, there's just so many of our celebrities and influencers these days that they just can't possibly have that same entourage that they used to. But then also those celebrities in the past had a very specific time where they were available to the public. They were playing a game and they could be seen for those that hour, hour and a half, or they're going to be going to a movie and a show. And that was it. The accessibility would start and stop at that point. But now what we're seeing is it's constant. You're live streaming as soon as you wake up in the morning, showing them where you're going for your breakfast, coffee, et cetera, throughout the entire day. So people can follow you and that obsession tendency can be very real. What do you say to folks who say, well, you know what, these folks should simply set better boundaries. You know, why, why invite me into your bedroom? Why invite me, you know, all these, all these places that used to be off limits, do a better job of putting uh, uh, guardrails on yourself. Yeah, that victimization mindset, making it their fault that how dare they should want security when they've chosen this profession. But then on the other hand, we're also validating that profession by following them and giving them billions of views each time. So it's a very mixed message of what we're giving them that please continue this access and this content, but also this is all your fault and we can't do anything about it. So that stigma really needs to stop. There is a really great documentary put together by Sweet Anita, who's a gamer. And she says that she really loves her profession. She just doesn't think she should have to die for it. And that quote is so profound because who should think that they're choosing their profession and that they're willing to die for it just because of they're giving their fans what they want? You know, I've heard from folks who've run into these sort of situations that when it gets to the point um, where they feel as though they have to go to law enforcement, that quite often law enforcement just doesn't know what to do with them. Yeah, and that's got to be so frustrating on both sides, right? So on their side, they're seeing these threats come in. They can point to exactly what this person said at this time, and that usually it's a death threat very specifically. But then on the police side, with how much online content there is right now, there is just no way for them to look into every single death threat that's put online. That is just not something that's going to be able to happen. And then on the few threats that you are able to validate intent, how do you then go from a profile that was made off of a VPN without any personal information associated with it and try to find the perpetrator in any kind of swift amount of time before it becomes no longer relevant? Mm. So the frustration is on both sides. Of course, going back to that desensitization, we have allowed people to say these things and just let it be this freedom of speech, which is not the case. It should not be that you are allowed to incite violence or conduct death threats online as part of your constitutional right. But then also what the streaming services need to do is a little bit more of that verified account 
process so that once an account makes a death threat, there is some research that can be done on the back end to see who was that, where are they, and how do we interrupt that possible switch from it just being an online threat to physical violence. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, and and I think you're the way you're describing it has a bit of nuance that I that I don't think I've heard a lot of people talk about, and that's that, you know, I, I think a lot of these platforms are kind of uh, I think their impulse is to hide behind Section Two Hundred and Thirty of the Communications Decency Act to say, oh, we're just a platform, we're allowing people on here, we can't be responsible for what they're saying, but to have that balance of allowing a certain amount of anonymity but still behind the scenes have verification of who people actually are, in my mind, that could be a bit of a sweet spot. Exactly. And right now, as it stands, yes, you are not allowed to make death threats. That is a violation of the terms of service of most, if not all, of these streaming services. But once an account gets locked or taken down, they can easily just make a new account and they don't need any personal information. That account doesn't need to be verified. So these people are just going through account after account after account, and it's impossible to tie it back to that initial death threat because it's all perceived as different people. Are there examples of influencers who are doing this particularly well? I mean, are, are there best practices in, in terms of um, using the tools that are available to manage your audience and, and um, you know, build a, a community that uh, has your back when these sorts of things arise? You know, that's a tough answer to provide because it's essentially proving a negative, right? The people who are not in the news for being stalked are the people who are most likely doing it right. (laughs) So I haven't been able to find many of them. But what people can do is not stream from your bedroom. Put a blanket background. Do not post while you're at certain locations that can be stalked. Post after the fact. Don't actually put any locations because if you go to it with any regularity, that link is going to be made. And then also requesting these streaming services, these people who have millions, if not billions of followers, have a point of influence with these streaming services to ask them for this verification. And I think that's their right to do so. Never would we not assume that in the physical world, these NBA stars or these movie stars would be able to be harassed, attacked, stalked at these locations without that overall company that's hosting them and allowing their stardom to protect them for that. So I think these streaming services, very similar to what we saw with Facebook, there's an obligation. You can no longer just say, we're the host, whatever happens, happens. You have a moral obligation to assist these people that you are providing this career for. Is there any recognition by regulators that this is an area that requires some of their attention? Yes, I do think there is, but it's such a complicated conversation because of exactly that freedom of speech line in the sand and then also Mm -hmm. the law enforcement bandwidth issue. So there's no easy solution, and that's why it keeps getting pushed back onto the influencer as their problem. You know, I, I've seen in, in some of the cybersecurity circles that I that I run in on social media that um, occasionally you'll see someone who takes it upon themselves to track down some of these folks who are up to no good, uh, you know, use um, open source information. And, and I have to say some of the most gratifying ones are when they discover that they're teenage boys and they reach out to their moms. <laughs> Yeah, I, even, I realize that's not. A, I realize that's not a scalable solution, but but it sure does feel good. <laughs> it sure does. Don't we love a good justice story, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Even if it's vigilante justice, sometimes you you can't help but smile. <laughs> but then that also depends on the mom doing the right thing. Even in this yeah. suit, Anita documentary, she she interviewed a bunch of other influencers about the security issues that they've had. And one of them identified that it was an underage male who had been stalking him and sending him death threats. And he reached out to the man's father and said, please make your son stop doing this. And the father's response was, my son would never do that. He's a good guy. Mm. So you're always having to depend on someone else to essentially do the right thing, (laughs) which is really hard to enforce. Right. Well, I mean, until we get there with with better tools and and better enforcement and, and, you know, as we say, making people register themselves on some of these platforms. 
to what degree is education uh, an element here of, of letting the folks know who want to be influencers, who aspire to that, um, you know, putting these best practices in, in front of them so that as, as they create these accounts and these personas that um, they know what they're in for, but they also have uh, the, the proper tools to, to try to manage these things. And I think this new generation knows that better than anybody, but it's this uh, middle generation that we still need to teach that to. Those mm. who just didn't think that when the internet first started that they they assumed that they could stay anonymous in the internet or that they could just take away one of their usernames and go to another and they'd never be associated between the two, even though they linked them by email address. So that history of the internet that doesn't forget ever this new generation gets that. And so I think that we have a good opportunity with them to identify these security protocols. But in regards to the education requirement, what we also need to do is remove this stigma that just because these stars are choosing this life, that they're Mm -hmm. not entitled to the same safety and privacy that we are. And again, this new generation is doing a great job of removing all stigma and taking away stereotypes. And so hopefully this will be one of the many things that they could do that with. But that's what we owe these people that we are asking to stream from their homes and that show us what products to buy and where to go, that they also have the right to inherent safety and privacy. Joe, what do you think? Dave, I might be too much of an angry old man here. Um, (laughs) But but I think the relationships that people have with influencers are unhealthy. Hmm. I think by their nature, they're unhealthy. There is a huge shift in the paradigm of what's valuable in industry. And one of the most valuable things in industry now is influence. Okay. Uh, And we see that in in the tech industry more than we see it anywhere else. Hmm. But influence has actually always been a very important part of like marketing and things like that. Sure. But now it's so amplified, right? Yeah. Through social media and through uh through the diversity of our of our general media as a as a whole. I mean mm-hmm. Remember, Dave, you remember when we were kids and we'd sit on the front porch and there'd only be three channels on TV? Well, you know what? I'm and, thinking about like when I, when we were, again, when, yes, when we were kids and my sister would be very excited to get the latest edition of Tiger Beat magazine. Right. Right. To see yeah. what sneakers Donny Osmond was wearing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to me, like that was the influencer culture back then. Yes. But I think. I, and I suspect part of what you're getting at here is that social media allows us to feel even more connected to these people. Right. Exactly. That, And that's my point, is that this is the same asymmetric relationship it's always been. Hmm. It has not changed, but it feels like it has. Okay. Right? Because you're interacting with people, or actually, I'm not interacting. You and I probably aren't. Do you follow any influencers, Dave? Uh, I, prob- I probably do. I I don't know. No, I guess not. Not no, not no one that people would consider. Not not like the big. The, no, none of right. the big ones. Like I follow on YouTube, Smarter Every Day and Jeremy Fielding. Yeah, but those guys do like, which by the way are great channels. And uh, Mark Rober is another good one. Uh, and I, I enjoy what those guys do, but I have no illusion that they know who Joe Kerrigan is. Right. Right. And when you're interacting with these people on like Facebook or on um, Twitch. They can see your comment roll by and they may say something about it, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, And that has a, that has an endorphin hit. Yeah. Right. So I, but I, I I really think that this is an unhealthy, overall, this is an unhealthy situation that people need to understand the asymmetric nature of this. It's still essentially going and getting a Tiger Beat magazine, (laughs) right? Right. 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 But it feels like the way you interact (laughs) with your friends on Facebook. Yeah. Or on Twitter or wherever your social media, whatever the kids are using these days. Right. Uh, that old man rant out of the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will say that what Laura is doing here is something that needs to be done. These people are subjected to, because of the very nature of what I just said, uh, these people are subjected to all kinds of things that other people are, you and I would never be subjected to because we're not influencers, right? Mm-hmm. And the operational security that these people have to go through, they really have to be mindful of this. 
one of the things about these influencers are, is that they're young people. Right. Right. And young people do stupid things. <laughs> Count on it. Right. And <laughs> right. as I've said, I think I've said this now continuously for three episodes. I'm glad this stuff wasn't around when I was a kid yeah. because, you well, know, I, I, I don't know. Youth is wasted on the young. It Joe. is. Yeah. <laughs> my son, when I say it to my son, he goes, and retirement's wasted on the old. <laughs> oh, okay. Fair enough. Touche. <laughs> right. But I don't know. You know me, Dave. I'm a big advocate for freedom of speech. Yes, you are. Right. Mm-hmm. But there are things that you can be punished for when you say them. Yeah. And I don't mean punished by some capricious moderating system. Okay. I mean legally punished for. Right. Uh, and when you take a class or take a, a major in something like communications or in journalism or in English or, you know, speech and debate, you quickly learn about the legal framework of freedom of speech. Right. Right. Freedom of speech is not the right to say anything at all. Yeah. And there are limits on that, like slander. Sure. Like if you say something that's slanderous of somebody, they can haul you into court and sue you. Mm-hmm. Um, if you make death threats against somebody, that's a criminal offense. Mm-hmm. They find out who you are, they can prosecute you criminally. Sure. Right? So, and I'm okay with that, even as a, a rabid free speech advocate. Yeah. You know? But from the streamer's perspective, from the uh, from the uh, influencer's perspective, you have to take this as an operational security problem. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you might. You have to understand, yeah, people are going to make these kind of death threats to you. How are you going to handle that? How mm-hmm. are you going to make sure that they don't find out where you live? Maybe you do something pseudonymous, right? Uh, can you even do that? Is that even possible? Is this a risk that you want to incur? These are judgments you have to make, and I don't think a lot of these younger people are prepared to make those judgments. Right. But I will say this. Do practice some operational security. Don't have pictures of you outside so that people can know where you are. Don't go to the same Starbucks every day. If you have habits— do not put those on your streams, hmm. right? Um, I love seeing the I'm going to tell their mom stories <laughs> that you were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and sometimes that ends well. But every now and then you get that, uh, that parent that's, uh, my kid's a good kid and wouldn't do that. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, my kids were both good kids too. Yeah. But- I didn't put it past him to do something remarkably stupid. <laughs> That's right, because we all have. Right, exactly. <laughs> right. So, right. you know, if somebody ever, nobody ever actually came to me and said, you know, your kid did this jerk thing. Right. Uh, but if they had, I would have gone, okay, I will I will have a conversation. Let me see. First yeah. off, let that me see what like you them. have. Right? Sounds <laughs> that like, sounds yeah. like them. Yeah. That sounds like them. <laughs> let me see what you got. Right. I will present this to them, and I will have a discussion with them. Yeah. And that will be the end of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, interesting uh, topic. And, yeah, it uh, is an interesting topic. And I understand that, that this needs to be done. But at the same point in time, I just don't think this relationship we have with these people is healthy. Yeah. Well, our thanks to Laura Hoffner for joining us. Again, she's an executive vice president at Concentric. And we do appreciate her taking the time for us. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. We want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.